from the Thai Cats Audio Network. This is Thai Cats Today with Louis Butko. Yes, it is. Thai Cats Today for a Tuesday, September the 20th, 2022. Thanks for checking us out on the Thai Cats Audio Network. Louis Butko here with you, and uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, make sure to like or subscribe to the Thai Cats Audio Network wherever you get your favorite podcasts uh, so you never miss this show or any of the other Great shows for you here on the Thai Cats Audio Network, like a brand new Coach O show with Luke Tasker. Uh, you can catch that now. You can catch a brand new episode of Simone Lawrence's Pay Me to Stop as he sits down with Andy Fan Twos. There's a new CFL this week as Bubba O'Neill is joined by uh, Matt Cause and uh, Milty, Steve Milton, Milton at the Spec, whatever we want to call him. Uh, so lots of great content available for your listening pleasure right now. On the Thai Cats Audio Network. Maybe you want to relive Saturday's big win. Well, you can listen to the whole game. Yeah, you can download it. You can put it on your headphones. You can take it with you. You can bring Tiger Cats post game with you as well. Uh, so, yeah, the Thai Cats Audio Network, all the news that you need to know for your favorite football team right here on the Thai Cats Audio Network. All right, coming up on today's show, we're going to hear from Coach O, as we normally do. We'll hear from Stephen Dunbar Jr. as well. And you might have heard this name uh, the last few weeks, uh, Dr. Carla Edwards. Uh, Dane talked about it in uh, Tiger Cat's post game. He talked about it leading into the game as well, that he's been working with her. And uh, kudos to Dane for being open and honest about uh, talking with a psychiatrist, a sports psychiatrist at that. And uh, her name is Dr. Carla Edwards. And we'll be joined by her, not to talk about any specifics, but just to kind of get the gist of, of what's a, what is a sports psychiatrist? Is it different than a sports psychologist? Where have we grown? Where do we still have work to do uh, when it comes to mental health in sports and in athletes? So uh, a great conversation with Dr. Carla Edwards coming up for you right here on Thai Cats today. A couple of news and notes to let you know about. Speaking of Dane, I mentioned this yesterday. I thought the Ticats were going to sweep the CFL top performers. I got one out of three right. Uh, Dane Evans was named the CFL's top performer. Not a top performer, the top performer uh, for week 15 in the CFL. His uh, 25 completions for 327 yards and a career-high five touchdown passes. Yeah, that'll do it as uh, the Tulsa, Oklahoma native led the Ticats on a game-sealing 14-play 90-yard touchdown drive, culminating with a six-yard touchdown pass to David Ungerer the third uh, in the final two minutes of the game. Meanwhile, Edmonton's Taylor Cornelius and Matthew Thomas. So how did Edmonton get two players? It, that's, come on. Matt Dunnigan, Marshall Ferguson of TSN, Pierre Vercheral of RDS. Come on. The Edmonton Elks. Got two players, but you couldn't throw Tim White a, a, a bone for a top performer. You couldn't Malik Carney. Mason Bennett had a great game. Whatever. Uh, you know what? Not whatever. Uh, it's great to see Dane being named a CFL top performer. Uh, missing a couple more Thai Cats on that list. Two Elks over two Thai Cats. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think they might have gotten this one... Uh, they might have gotten two and three wrong. They definitely got number one right, and that's Dane Evans. Uh, Dane is uh, named a top performer for the second time uh, this season, and he's the third Thai Cat to be named a top performer as well. Tim White probably should have been the fourth. Not probably should have been the fourth. Forget it. I'm saying it right now. Tim White, two touchdowns, was unreal. I had a great game, but uh, I guess Taylor Cornelius and uh, Matthew Thomas uh, were second and third respectively. All right, uh, rant for the day over there. Uh, little, uh, one other thing to let you know about. The Tigats announced that they have signed American offensive lineman Brandon Kemp. The 25-year-old most recently spent training camp with the NFL's Indianapolis Colts after originally signing with the Tennessee Titans as an undrafted free agent. He's 6'7", 310, big guy. He played 43 games over five seasons at Valdosta State University where he helped the Blazers to its first undefeated season in school history en route to the school's fourth NCAA Division II National Championship in 2018. So some more help on the offensive line for the Hamilton Tire Cats. Uh, this was their first time back on the field. First time we had a chance to catch up with Coach O, and uh, we asked him uh, whether uh, whether much changes following a, a win. Here's what he had to say. Yeah, I mean, anytime you win, it, it feels great. You know, as far as uh, a weight, that's up to the individuals. I just knew we were going to work hard. And, yeah, it's uh, it was an important game for us, um, not only being at home, but it was our next game. 
against, uh, you know, obviously the defending Grey Cup champions or two time. So just proud of the effort of everybody. So um, I don't know if that's the right analogy, but uh, it was an important win for us for sure. Yeah, I think I think there's always confidence that's instilled and you want to carry your mindset and those type of things over to the next game. But every game has its own meaning. We're playing a different opponent. Um, you know, they they do different things. Uh, we'll be in their house and, you know, it'll be a travel for us. So everything's a little bit different. Uh, you know, the, the, long, the length of the game and those type of things will always remain the same. But our focus and everything else uh, should actually be heightened. Yeah, well, oddly enough, I, I can remember Keandre. I think it was the first practice catching a fade ball in the end zone uh, at McMaster and uh, just kind of saying, wow, we'll see what happens. And, uh, you know, he's learning how to become a pro, um, what that means, you know, for, you know, people that come from youth sports and whatnot, you know, I always like to refer to it as they're already into their, their sophomore or their second year because you're playing so many games. And so there's a, there's a way to learn how to be a pro uh, when you become, when you start playing, you know, 20 games, those type of things. Keandre is a hard worker every day. He got, you know, he, he got his opportunity by busting his tail on special teams and never complained, just showed up at work and made everybody around him better because he practiced so hard. And then he's made the most of the opportunities. So uh, his best football is still in front of him, and uh, he's still learning the game. Yeah, they play hard. They're playing at home. Um, you know, they've, they've beat us, so they'll be, they'll be a confident group. They're going to be fresh. They're coming off a bye. Um, they'll have watched plenty of film. So, you know, we know it's going to be a heavyweight fight and, and whatnot. But, again, those are, that's what we're expecting. But the, the majority of the focus is always on ourselves and, and our own execution. But, listen, they're going to they're gonna be gunning for us, and um, they'll be fresh. But, uh, you know, the lead up and the talk about it's fun. But, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to play the game. That is the head coach and president of football operations, Orlando Steinauer, as we caught up with him after practice today. Also had a chance to catch up with Stephen Dunbar Jr. Uh, had himself a, a good game as he reeled in a touchdown pass. Uh, nice to see him find the end zone again. He's got six touchdowns on the season. Uh, and again, caught up with him after practice today and asked... Uh, if the mood has changed following the win or if there's a, a weight off the shoulders following Saturday. Yeah, man, I think uh, when you, anytime you win games like that against a good team, man, it's, uh, it's good for the morale, it's good for the guys. It's good to, you know, you know, catch a rhythm and build some confidence. So it definitely felt like, you know, we're in, we in, we in the right direction. So now it's like we just got to go back to work and um, try to stack some things together now. So. I was about to say, it's about, like you said, it's about stacking. So mm -hmm. how do you... How do you stack good practices on a good game? I think it's just a matter of just, you know, being consistent, man. Just just being consistent, understanding, you know, through the through that win, how good we can be, and then it's understanding how we, you know, how we got to this point, man. And that was just through hard work, so we can't, you know, get satisfied. We gotta just continue to be consistent in our work ethic and, you know, executing the game plan and being 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 clean on on, on game day. So. I think that's the biggest thing is just consistency. I think it's always great, man. It's, you know, when you see guys being able to spread the ball around and, and, you know, get everybody involved in the game, it just shows how talented we are on offense and how many guys who actually can make that play when that number is called. So it was fun to watch. You know, even even though I'm in the game and I'm participating too, it was just fun to, fun, fun to see guys like Keandre, guys like Dave, you know, who, who just kind of just grind out every day waiting on the opportunity. And, you know, when it when it came, they made the most of it, so it was dope. Nah, yeah, I like Keandre a lot, man. He got he got a lot to him. Uh, he's definitely a lot further. He's a lot more mature than he was when he got here. Um, he's always been a guy that went really really hard. Um, he just had to, you know, kind of gain his focus and mature a little bit. And I, you know, I'm I'm excited to see, you know, the player he is coming in the future. Yeah, he had a, he had he had that he had that old dang look in his eye, man. I think it was. Yeah, he made a scramble, and then, you know, I think he got the first down, and he got up, and he was screaming. He was going crazy. I was like, oh, yeah, I think I, I think I looked over to Tim. I was like, oh, yeah, now I got his swagger back. And um, it was good to see him out there having fun, man. I think he, you know, he was able to have fun. He's getting his confidence, and he's he's feeling, you know, he's feeling himself. He's feeling himself. I'm glad he had that, that game. I think he needed that one. Um, just like I said before, man, we just got to be consistent and play clean. I think 
Uh, our biggest issues have been just being, you know, executing, especially down the stretch in the, you know, the end of the third and fourth quarter, not getting relaxed or, you know, getting complacent with success. But it's closing games. I think a lot of the games we, you know, we was up, you know, we just didn't close. So I think it's just making sure that, you know, we focus on that point in the game where it's like, you know, coming into the midway through the fourth or coming into the fourth quarter and just like, okay, this is the moment we got to really lock in. And um, I think as a team, if we just learn how to close out games, you know, like we did last week, I think we'll be fine. And that is Stephen Dunbar Jr. as we caught up with him after practice today. All right, you may have heard her name recently, uh, Dr. Carla Edwards. She's a sports psychiatrist. She works with professional athletes, including uh, some here with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And she's with us now to uh, dig a little bit deeper on what that means. And uh, Dr. Carla, thank you so much for doing this. Sports psychiatrist, is it just a psychiatrist who treats athletes? Uh, well, to take us a little bit, tell us a little bit more about this. I guess in general, you could say that. Uh, I, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And uh, and I, I have to say, I have a lot of fun with what I do. Um, my, my two biggest passions are sports and mental health. And I've um, been grateful for the opportunity to bring both together in my career. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is, is being able to deliver mental health and mental performance support to athletes with a lens that really identifies and captures the nuances, the specific characteristics and unique areas that athletes alone and and I guess other high performers performance artists um, experience which is a little bit different from the general population now is it fair to say that we've come some way a long way uh, a little bit we still got a ways to go I mean where have we come when it comes to sports psychiatry I'd say we're on the pathway uh we're better than we were 10 years ago I think uh You know, part of it is really trying to understand uh, where we fit in the pie. There's a lot of people who are really needed to support the the full health and well-being of athletes. And we all have our roles and we all have great things that we bring. Uh, And and psychiatrists would never try to replace what a psychologist does or a mental performance consultant. I think we all have wedges of the pie. There are some skill sets that we share. Uh, What a psychiatrist brings is the fact that we're medical doctors to begin with. So we have the ability to run diagnostic tests look at things from a bio psychosocial medical kind of model we have the ability to prescribe if necessary but we also have the background in psychotherapy and with the sport lens the ability to weave in again those nuances of the lifestyle of an athlete the additional pressures that an athlete brings and you know facing the pressures of uh, being in the spotlight and having to perform on demand Uh, so we're able to cover all of those things but complement what other people do uh, for for the athlete's well-being as well so Take us through what an athlete, I mean, uh, people have jobs, athletes have jobs. So what would an athlete maybe be struggling with in terms of uh, their day to day that, that in, in, in a normal job, somebody could say, well, why, why should I see a psychiatrist? It's a great question. And people should see psychiatrists. Yes, I agree. (laughs) And psychotherapists. I think everybody could benefit from that. Uh, I think, you know, when we look at the general day that an an athlete has, they wake up very early and they get to their uh, training venue and they spend hours and hours looking at film, doing physical treatment, doing their lifting, meeting with their coaches, having team meetings, getting on the field, just looking at football specifically, uh, doing whatever practice that is that day, you know, doing the debriefs, having more meetings, and then going home and reviewing more video and preparing, you know, putting the last game to bed and preparing for the yeah. upcoming person. So really they're, they're eating, sleeping, drinking, living uh, sports almost all the time. And, you know, we layer into that young children, babies, n- you know, new families having to, you know, still get their kids to school on time, still, you know, bring, bring home the bacon type of thing in terms of money. Uh, and then layer in on top of that, in the CFL in particular, players who are coming from different countries who are here and dealing with different currencies. And again, all of those issues, young families Mm -hmm. and family, um, other, you know, commitments back home in a whole other country. Um, It it just adds layers and layers and uh, get can get pretty intertwined. And then they have to show up and perform in front of millions of people sometimes on on a weekly basis and their contracts are riding on it. If they don't perform, you know, their future is at risk. So lots of pressure all the time. Yeah, I mean, to, I, and it feels I, I I'm lucky enough to get to be around a lot of these guys every day, and and you know I I do see the the negative side of sometimes you know fans get on players and that uh, that's part of it. These people, these athletes, these high performance athletes, 
it's so important to remember they're human too. Absolutely. And I think they would all recognize that the fans are really, really important from an energy point of view. And bar none, since the, co since the pandemic began, you know, some sports have experienced uh, the game without the fans. Right? The, the NFL ran some games without fans. The NHL had almost a whole season without fans. It's just a whole different energy. So fans bring a positive energy. They can also bring extra pressure. So part of the skill development that I do with the athletes is really using that energy for good and then cutting it off when it uh, reaches that limit and then being able to filter it the things that aren't very helpful. Uh, I'm probably butchering this. Dr. Daniel Begel is a sports psychiatrist from back in the day. And there was one thing I had read in preparation of this chat um, that really stuck out to me, just, I guess, in terms of what I do, but sports is not merely a hobby mm -hmm. is what he has said. And, and I guess for, for people who watch and for fans, it is, it's something that you get to watch. It's a distraction for these players and people that you work with high, this, this really is their whole life. And how, how crucial is that for you to, to know that you are balancing something that again, maybe not a, a, a particular psychologist might deal with. I, you, you bring out a good point there. And, and Dan Beagle, I mean, he, he deserves a lot of credit. He was one of the founding members of our International Society for Sports Psychiatry, which I'm fortunate enough to be the president of right now. So he's been a great mentor for me. But you're absolutely right. It, it isn't a hobby for many people. And it's something that um, really is central to not just their identity, because we try to come to get away from that a little bit, because we don't want everybody's, you know, full survival, depending on how they're performing necessarily. It's not very healthy. Mm -hmm. But it is central to their whole life experience. You know, we have many athletes who play for Hamilton, who in Hamilton are celebrities. They're known on the streets. They bring a lot to our community. They give back to our schools. They go home to small town Nebraska, and nobody knows them from the car salesman, right? So um, sport can bring a lot of joy to our lives. It can bring a lot of meaning and purpose. Um, and, and again, for a certain period in their lives, it is their sole source of income, right? And we look at jobs longitudinally for, for everybody else, and we can be in our jobs for decades and mm -hmm. still do what we do and do it quite well and do until we want to retire. But truly for athletes, they have a period in their life when they can and they need to, and they need to live that out as much as they can during those windows until they can't anymore. Uh, so those those years are really, really important. And for them, it is it is their bread and butter. It's their, mo you know, their reason for being. Um, it is how they send money home to their families. And it is really important. And their days truly do revolve around it. You mentioned uh, you, you believe everybody should see some, if they, they should talk to somebody, psychologist, psychiatrist, um, are we getting there? What more do we need to do? Because we definitely need to do more and conversations are happening. And even that term conversations are happening is, is great, but what can we do more to, to really put this where it belongs front and center, you know, mental health is, is your health. I think there's two different parts of this. One is in, in the general public, um, more people would do it if they had access and means. So right now, there's not enough psychiatrists to see everybody who needs one, and psychotherapy is often outside of someone's ability to pay for, and a lot of it's not covered by their health insurance. So finances and access are really a big barrier, I think, for the general population, or more people absolutely would access it. In the sports world, we're starting to get more teams and organizations to have professionals like myself involved with them and available to coaching staff and athletes and the organization to target exactly what I've been doing with the Ticats. Uh, but we're still, I think, encountering stigma and mm -hmm. um, reluctance to admit when, you know, they may need help because that may reflect a flaw or a weakness and they worry about contracts and people finding out and uh, being viewed as uh, probably not something that uh, a team wants to invest in. But I truly believe that, you know, with, with the Dane's openness in the last couple of weeks and really, you know, putting out there the work that he's been doing and, and clearly seeing some benefits, and this might be a watershed moment for, for athletes in sport to see such a pivotal figure really be out there saying, hey, <laughs> this is really important and, and look what can happen when you actually do take care of this. So we, we may see the tide starting to turn here. Yeah, absolutely. And and I guess the one thing with athletes in particular, and and again, I go back to, because I, I just, the vitriol sometimes that they, they get exposed to or, or the borderline abuse sometimes, athletes are are is it true that they're more prone things? I mean, traumatic brain injuries, you would have to think um, substance abuse, mm -hmm. they, like 
there there's there's a whole wide range of issues that athletes might deal with particularly because they're an athlete absolutely and there there has been scientific studies uh done looking at this for many years in terms of eating disorders and which sports are more likely to lead to those right mm-hmm. the aesthetic sports the aerial sports things that require small uniforms uh, or weight classes, um, certainly in collision sports, uh, hockey, soccer, you know, football, the head injuries and subsequent mental health challenges, you know, team sports are more likely to lead to substance abuse issues. And yeah, we we do have a lot of data and a lot of support for that. Um, I think we're still at a point where, you know, when when choices are being made in terms of where to invest in resources for an organization or a team, um, very broadly still, um, mental health is is not a resource that's on the top of the list frequently. Hopefully that's going to change. So to that point, the, your work that you do with the Hamilton Tiger Cats, w- where are the Tiger Cats in terms of, are they, are they leaders by bringing you in? What more can they do? What more can we do? I, I truly believe they're leaders in the field. They're, they're ahead of the curve. Uh, and I hope, you know, people are paying attention and are willing to, to really take their lead on this. Uh, the Blue Bombers have a pretty good mental health program as well. Um, so I think we can see how that translates really on the field. Um, yeah, I, I think we're very fortunate in our medical leadership within the Tiger Cats. Dr. Ayeni is a, you know, he's a foundational person in so many ways and a pioneer, and he recognizes the, the benefits of mental health. And he's always been a, a very strong advocate. And really, without him, I wouldn't be in this position. So his leadership the support of the entire medical staff and training staff, and then the organization, they need to buy in, they need to listen. If, if they didn't believe it was uh, important, I wouldn't be here either. So I think across the board, we have uh, fantastic champions within our organization who are really pulling this forward. Now, uh, you're a high, former high performance athlete yourself, aren't you? I believe in my heart that I still am, but yes, former. <laughs> okay, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to offend. I didn't mean to offend. Uh, I believe you are too, Dr. Carla, don't worry. Uh, but to that point, though, how do you feel like your personal experience has helped you get to this point and, and to be able to, uh, again, it's apples and oranges sometimes comparing what athletes go through, but how do you feel like your personal experience has brought you where you are today? I think without it, I wouldn't be where I am. Sport alone just opened so many doors for me and opportunities and really informed my decisions and and who I associated with. Uh, And then recognizing early in my my psychiatry training that there were huge gaps in athlete mental health and then finding ways to fill that um, and getting to this point where truly I do bring in my experience when I speak with all athletes. It doesn't matter what sport you've played. It doesn't matter you know, whether you've been to an Olympics or or you're a professional football player or, um, you know, university player. It's it's the mentality. It's it's understanding the life, um, the lifestyle. It's understanding those pressures, um, the language of the sport. I love learning about all different sports: bobsleigh, fencing, football. Getting the lingo and getting in there. And many many athletes have said it really makes a difference when, you know, the mental health provider, the practitioner, the therapist understands understands the part of sport because in the non-sport world, very commonly the advice given to athletes is, well, if you're stressed, just give up your sport. Uh, we know that that would actually have the opposite effect on uh, on athletes where it has real meaning for. So I think it's very helpful. So what is your piece of advice? Um, I'm not a oh. pro athlete, but, you know, I, everybody, everybody who's listening to this, I'm sure is not a pro athlete, maybe more in the my category here. Uh, what's your advice to someone who, who's dealing with mental health or somebody who who thinks they what's the next step they should take if they feel like, okay, things are, you mentioned it, the access is, can be difficult, but what's, what's your advice to somebody who's listening to this right now? Yeah, I think a, a start would be um, having a conversation with your family doctors, if you have them just to explore. And it's, it's not uncommon. Like a lot of the athletes who come to me say, I don't even know how to do this. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to talk about, but I, I'm, I, my friends tell me I should probably talk to somebody. Mm very common place to start so either if your friends have told you you should talk to somebody if you thought something's not quite right I don't feel like myself it's time maybe to open up that door of conversation with somebody now most provinces also have distress lines or mental health lines that are free to access and that might be a place to start understanding how uh, a lot of people don't have family physicians and it's hard to get appointments these days so finding that avenue that portal of entry and starting that conversation it may lead to a point where you realize, okay, uh, it's not as big a deal as I thought, and I just need to make some lifestyle changes, and that would be great. Or it might open up pathways for for more help. It's it's really about that initial starting point. And again, seeing people like Dane, who are leaders in the industry and 
just speak about it openly and not a shame, not like it's just, and there was one line he said, he's like, yeah, listen, I want to be a coach one day. I've always been coached. I've always had a coach for everything I do. Why wouldn't I have a coach for my mind? Absolutely. It, it totally makes sense. And, and I think it's very clear that, uh, um, you know, the mental side of everything we do is probably 80% really of, of what we end up doing. So what's the harm in exploring it? Yeah. And that's, that's such a great point. Cause I, you know, when things weren't going well this season, I asked a lot of guys and I said, Hey, how much of this game is mental? And they say 90. And when they say 90, percent of the game is mental especially especially high performance athletes and to that point you know when when i do ask that question because the differences in these athletes the difference in the players that we're watching they're all the best at what they do it's just that extra one two percent and that could be right up here right it makes a big difference even in other sports like swimming and cycling where a hundredth of a second mm -hmm. will make the difference between a gold medal and a non-podium position. So yeah. if you if you put in a little bit of effort on that mental side of things, you put in a ton of physical effort and training, hours and hours and hours, even a little bit of mental training can make that difference. Well, on that note, I think that's a great piece of advice for, for anyone listening to this. And uh, Dr. Carla, really insightful stuff. I, I really appreciate you doing this. Dr. Carla Edwards is a sports psychiatrist. And uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, Louis. Pleasure. And that is sports psychiatrist, Dr. Carla Edwards. And uh, my thanks to Dr. Carla for joining me today. Uh, and I very much appreciate it. And uh, a very eye-opening conversation. And it's important to keep having that conversation, the mental health conversation. And uh, she gave kudos to, to Dane for being open with it. And uh, I encourage you to uh, to be open about talking about mental health as it's uh, it's super important. And uh, with Movember right around the corner, uh, that's always a, a, a great time to talk about it. But it's never a bad time to talk about mental health. So uh, my thanks to Dr. Carla for joining me. And my thanks to Dane for opening uh, the door to the conversation um, that we're having today, that we had today. Uh, by talking about Dr. Carla and uh, and again, no no shame in in admitting that you need help and uh, just that great line there about uh, coaching for your mind. Uh, it's super important, especially for these high performance athletes. All right, Ty Cats fans, the annual Tim Horton Smile Cookie campaign is back. 100% of the proceeds from sales of Smile Cookies will support charities and community groups across Canada. To participate in this year's Smile Cookie campaign, visit your local Tim Hortons restaurant or place an order through the Tim Hortons mobile app for delivery. And uh, I was on Morning Live this morning on CHCH, and uh, we had cookies dropped off to us. And uh, Kelly, who was on the anchor desk today, she pointed to something out. Smile cookies, and no offense to regular Tim Hortons chocolate chip cookies, but smile cookies just taste a little bit better. And it's probably because all that money that's going to a great charity or community group across Canada, uh, that must be it. Or it's just the extra icing. I, I don't know what it is, but some about smile cookies, uh, they're, they're better than the average chocolate chip cookie for sure. All right, uh, I'm going to go eat some more smile cookies. I'll be back here tomorrow, same time, same place, right here on the Thai Cats Audio Network. Thanks for checking us out. Appreciate it. I'm Louis Butko from all of us here at the Thai Cats Audio Network. Hoping you have a great day. Thai Cats today can be heard every weekday, and we would like to hear from you. Email us at gameday at ticats.ca. Have a question or an opinion? We want to hear it. That's gameday at ticats.ca. Subscribe to the Ticats Audio Network on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.